Hi everyone. Uh, we just finished reviewing um, the membrane, its structure, and some of the key features of the membrane of cells. And we've also talked about diffusion and passive transport, which are certain different ways that molecules can get through the membrane. Uh, right now we're going to be talking about um, a couple other ways that molecules can get through the membrane. Um, all of these involve energy. And so without further ado, Okay, so 5.7 talks about the discovery of the aquaporin. And so this is relating back to um, osmosis and just the passive transport of water through the membrane. But um, it's actually pretty interesting how they discovered this specific protein that allows water to go through. Um, and if you walk through your textbook, it talks about how the scientists actually took the mRNA of this unidentified protein and they decided to inject it in frog cells. And frog cells are known for being very impermeable to water normally. So they put in this new mRNA and um, they found that it coded for some new protein that was present in the cell. And they decided to subject these experimental cells that had um, that new mRNA next to the control cells and they put them in hypotonic solutions. So remember, hypotonic solution means that the water uh, concentration or the concentration of solutes outside of the cell is lower than inside the cell, which means that water wants to rush inside the cell, right? Um, so they decided to compare both cells and see uh, the effects. And they found that after some time, the experimental cells with this new coded protein uh, were much, much bigger than the control cell. And so for them, that's indicated that this new protein allows water to enter in the cell rapidly. And they found that this protein, which allows water to enter into the cell, is the aquaporin. And so that's kind of how they discovered the aquaporin. Um, right here is just a picture of the experimental cells with the aquaporin. And you can see over time how it got much larger. Um, it's about to lyse after this point. Whereas here, the cells without aquaporins, um, even though they were subjected to the same hypotonic environment, because they didn't have many proteins that allowed water to enter the cell, it pretty much stayed the same size. Okay, moving on. So we've just finished wrapping up everything on different passive types of transport. Active transport um, requires energy, and it often moves solutes against its concentration gradient, which means that it moves the solutes from high, uh, sorry, low concentration to high concentration which is the exact opposite of what it normally wants to do, which is why it requires energy. And so in terms of the exact process, how this happens, uh, first the solute actually binds to the transport protein. And so you can see in this picture right here, um, it's gonna fit inside here. And after it does that, um, ATP comes and attaches, it phosphorylates this transport protein, and it just attaches its phosphate group onto the protein. And in doing so, it actually is able to change the shape of the protein. And by changing the shape of the protein, it's allowed, it pops the solute from the low concentration to the outside where it's the higher concentration. Um, and then afterwards, the phosphate group detaches. So this right here, the step number two, is the energy requiring step. It requires ATP for the protein to change its shape and move the solute against its concentration gradient. Um, this right here is a picture of the different types of transport we've been talking about. Um, you can see on the left hand side, this is simple diffusion, which means the molecules can go straight through. And remember that means that it's nonpolar and very small. Um, over here are just different types of channel proteins that allow for passive transport, which means it goes down its concentration gradient from high to low concentration, um, and it doesn't require any energy. And then here's the last one we just talked about, which is active transport. And you can see that it requires an input of energy uh, for the molecule to bind there and change its shape so it pops out to the other side where it goes um, to the place where it's higher concentrated. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about is bulk transport. Um, this involves uh, the taking in or releasing of really large types of molecules. Um, endocytosis, endo means in, and that's when they, it takes the cell, it takes in um, substances from outside the cell to bring it inside the cell. Um, there's three different types of endocytosis that you guys are responsible to know. Uh, phagocytosis is the equivalent of like eating, the cell eating things that are very large and outside of the cell. Pinocytosis right here, um, is closer to like the cell drinking in things, like taking in fluid or very small solutes. 
And then receptor-mediated endocytosis, this one right here, is when the cell takes in specific molecules that bind to the receptor on the cell membrane. Um, and the last thing is exocytosis. This is when the cell tries to like eject things outside of itself. So um, it's the opposite of endocytosis. Yep, and both of these processes require energy. This right here is a picture of exocytosis. You could see this uh, vesicle right here, which is coated with a, protein, with a membrane. It starts to fuse with the plasma membrane. And as it begins to fuse with the plasma membrane, um, all the things inside of itself, it gets um, sent to outside of the cell. And this right here is a picture of a, a microscopic view of it. Um, this does a lot of different things. It could either move materials outside of the cell. Um, it could uh, actually plants also use it to transport um, cell wall material to the cell wall. Um, uh, this slide uh, represents the different types of endocytosis. So right here we have phagocytosis, which remember is like the cell eating. And what happens is it'll take in large molecules or large, just like large substances outside of the cell. Um, and it begins to form these like pseudo, pseudo arms that kind of come out and then wrap around the, um, the food and then it closes in on itself and then forms a new food vacuole right here. Um, so this is phagocytosis. Pinocytosis is pretty similar except for it, it forms more of an indentation. And then as it forms that indentation, it kind of takes in just like the liquids and very, very small solutes and then it forms the vesicle. So that's how it kind of drinks or takes in liquids. And then right here, this last panel shows receptor-mediated um, endocytosis. And you can see that there's these little receptor proteins on the side of the cell membrane. And it binds with very specific solutes. And when it does, it starts to close in on itself. There's coat proteins, which are on the, um, on the inner side of the cell membrane. And it kind of helps the cell membrane to pinch in and form this new coated vesicle, which has the very specific solutes that the cell wants. This right here is a nice picture of, I think, that last receptor-mediated uh, uh, receptor um, endocytosis. And you can see um, over here, this is the coat proteins. And then on this side are the receptor proteins. And you can see things are starting to bind and come inside of it. And then as the things are binding inside, you see that it starts to pinch in on itself and form this new vesicle with the coat proteins right around it. And then inside are the receptor proteins and the specific uh, solutes that it wants. All right. Thanks so much for watching, guys.